This is Doug Mayo. I'm the Jackson County Extension Director, and I'm here today with Dr. Ann Blunt, and she's going to share with us the preliminary results from her forage uh, demonstration trial on cool season forages. Uh, we've had a really challenging year thus far. We had very little moisture to plant into in the fall, uh, and and limited moisture all the way up in through January. We were in the stream, extreme uh, drought category, and then recently have had substantial rain. And so we're out today on uh, February 15th, looking at the different forage types that were planted both on that November 1st and December 1st. I'm Ann Blunt. I'm the forage breeder for University of Florida, located up at the NFREC in Mariana. We're going to take a little walk through a forage demonstration nursery that's been funded by the Milk Checkoff for Georgia and Florida. This has been an annual event for the last 18 years where we go around the state and plant a series of different types of forages for cool season to show end users like dairymen and beef cattle operators the types of forages that could be grown in the fall of the year and different varieties within each group of forage. Part of the reason is also to help us develop new forages that fit our end user and so it's been a sentinel plot for us around the state for diseases and just productivity. Okay, the first forages that we're going to look at this afternoon are, is start, we're going to start with triticale. So triticale is a wheat by rye cross and the reason I've been in favor of planting triticale is it has a lot of the attributes of the rye parent and it has the quality of the wheat parent. The first plot that Doug is standing next to is Trical 342 just by itself. So uh, triticale, you can see it's very, very leafy. It doesn't have um, the tall kind of slender stem that cereal rise develop. It stays pretty much leafy throughout the whole growing season. The plot on the other side of Doug is a mixture of Trical 342 and early ployed ryegrass. We made that blend because that gives you a very long season forage production. So when triticale would start to play out, the ryegrass would essentially take over. So for a long period for grazing, a mixture of some type of a small grain with the ryegrass would be optimal. The first oat that we're going to look at is called Cossack oat. It has been marketed in the past as a black oat, but it's actually a regular yellow oat. It's a Vena sativa. What we're finding is it tends to get disease pressure later on in the growing season. Initially, it looks very good. The, the cost factor might be a little high compared to some of the other oat varieties, but it is on the market, and a number of folks are looking at it for early season forage production. The next oat is Legend Oat, Legend 567 that's been developed locally on a dairy farm for specifically uh, early uh, forage production so that for the dairymen they could actually plant uh, corn on time around the beginning of March. So it is our second earliest small grain and where it fits is in a blend with ryegrass so that you could graze it in a beef cattle situation. You'll have it for very early grazing and in a blend with ryegrass after this matures, the ryegrass would come on and so you'd have long season production. It has excellent disease resistance to barley yellow dwarf and the current strain of crown rust. Our next oat is another forage type oat. It's Horizon 306. It also has fairly good rust resistance, although it is rust susceptible. It's a very good mid-season to late-season forage producer. Uh, very good, reliable oat that's on the market. A little bit later than the legend. Our next oat is a very old oat called Florida 501 oat. It was uh, released many decades ago and still tends to be a good oat but in the years when we have warm springs it will tend to come down with rust and the barley yellow dwarf so this is one of the reasons why we recommend that you use newer varieties even though in some years some of our older oats look quite good the second to last oat is Coker 227. This is a very popular oat. Most of us consider this like a common oat variety. 
So Coker 227 in its heyday was an excellent variety, but now it breaks down fairly quickly to, to, to barley yellow dwarf and to uh, the local strain of cereal rust. So crown rust on, on this particular variety, we usually don't recommend it. We would rather you use one of the newer, more improved varieties that have better disease resistance overall. And the last oat that we put looks excellent here. This is a feed oat. This is if you just went to a feed and seed store and bought what was in a bag. But it, we don't know what's in the bag. And most of this seed was produced up in Minnesota or out in Scandinavia. And because of that, it has never been tested for our diseases locally. And many years, when we have a cold winter, this particular oat will completely freeze out. So it's, it's very cheap, but it's certainly very risky. And so we do not recommend that you use feed oats uh, for your winter forage program. The other phenomenon that we see often, especially after we have a cold snap in oats, is a lot of lower leaf damage. And often we get called because people think it is disease related, but it's what we call winter stress or cold stress on oats. Many of our commercial oat varieties are very susceptible to early frost events. And that's what this is in here where you see a lot of the lower leaves. This is done. a very good example of what day length differences can do to different types of varieties within a group. So now we're gonna look at the cereal rise. The first example that Doug is standing next to is Florida 401 rye. It's a very, very old variety. It's been a very stable variety over many years. It is the earliest of all our cool season forages. It gets up and gets growing, but the problem is it's already February, middle February, and it's heading out. So this type of a cereal rye should be used in conjunction if you're in a grazing program with a ryegrass so that when this plays out, the ryegrass would be coming on underneath it. It is very early compared to the Renzabrezzi that is just next to it, as you can see the height comparison on a February 15th date. So for many of us who are grazing beef cattle, we really would desire a much earlier type of forage production to keep us from having to use up our conserved hay if, if that's what you rely on in the winter time. Most of us, however, buy Renzabrezzi, so that's what that would look like compared to Florida 401, much, much later. Of course, it's well adapted. It's been uh, a very popular variety. It's basically what we call common rye. Then next to it, we have a series of, of other proprietary type varieties. This is Kelly Grazer from uh, Kelly C Company in Alabama. Looks very similar to Renza Brezzi, a little bit thicker, maybe a little bit more forage production, but in general, what I call a, a Brezzi type. Then we move over into the, the varieties that were developed in Oklahoma by the uh, Noble Foundation and are marketed in out of Oklahoma, most of the seed has been shipped into Florida. You have Elbon and then next to it, Maton rye. Typically, they're very, very late in forage production for us. So depending on when you need your forage, that should help you decide what varieties within a forage class you might want to purchase. So that's Elbon, next to it is Maton. Most, most of them are typically considered very late season. Okay, the next two forage demonstration strips are two wheat varieties. Now, why would we recommend wheat? Uh, most wheat are bred as grain types, so they're not very good forage producers, but you can ensure a wheat crop, and in a year when wheat seed is valuable, you could actually either graze and then maybe harvest the seed at the end of the season, or you can maybe just grow it as a grain crop. So wheat has its place for its insurability and also for the potential for seed sales. But as you can see, wheat compared to the other forages that we just uh, looked at, they're very late in, in season production. So as far as total productivity, they're on the very low end of our recommendation for uh, beef cattle and dairy cattle operations. Also, typically, we have a lot of disease problems associated with wheats, and oftentimes the wheats that we would choose for forage types are not marketed in, in the Florida area. Okay, so now we're going to look at ryegrass. So one thing I want to start by saying is ryegrass typically runs about a month later in forage production than small grains. So whether it's overseeded 
on grass pastures or on cultivated land, you'll always get about a month delay in forage production when you go with just ryegrass alone. That's the reason why we recommend blending small grains and ryegrass for that long season period of forage production. Doug is standing in front of common ryegrass. Common is sometimes called Gulf annual ryegrass, but what it is is we really don't know the variety that's in the bag that's sold fairly cheaply on the market. So you get what you pay for. We don't really know what variety is in there. We don't know whether it produces a lot of seed or a lot of forage. And typically in, in yield trials, it is the lowest end of our variety testing program's productivity. What you see if you look across all the different ryegrass varieties is we gave you several different options of varieties that are on the current market. We have a lot of excellent improved varieties. Texas and University of Florida have uh, strong breeding programs in ryegrass. Doug is standing next to early ployed ryegrass. Right now you can't see how much these varieties will differentiate because as I said, they're very photo period sensitive. They produce later forage than the small grain, so they have not yet started to differentiate between the different varieties. However, Doug is standing next to the earliest of our ryegrasses called early ployed. And early ployed works very well when mixed in with some of the earlier small grains and that alleviates a lot of the uh, need for conserved forages. Just a very good choice of blending two types of forages together. However, we have, besides early ploy being the earliest, we have Big Boss and Prine and Attain and about 35 other recommended varieties for the Southeast United States that are all improved. And they've been improved for disease resistance to rust and uh, to another disease called gray leaf spot. I, again, you get what you pay for. You pay a little bit more per pound for, for improved varieties and you get it back in, in forage production and disease resistance. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Blunt today for showing us uh, the work that she's doing, some real clear takeaways. Uh, certainly the combination of triticale and ryegrass or other small grains and ryegrass uh, gives you a season-long grazing in the cool season. And the newer varieties, uh, like the legend oak, clearly have an advantage, as does the early ployed, for early season grazing. So here we are in February, uh, rainfall has been short. We can see that these superior varieties are putting uh, pounds of grazing out there for our animals at this time of year.